um, just to let you know. And then the recording gets uploaded onto our YouTube channel and onto the website as well. If, if you weren't able to attend the session or the whole of the session, then you can access it there. Um, so we try to have a seminar once a month on this topic, and we try to generate conversations and research collaborations around the intersections of social and technical issues um, and the transitions to renewable energy, to look at justice and alleviation of energy poverty, um, social acceptance of different kinds of technologies, um, and a, a range of other topics. Um, so also, if you have any suggestions for the seminar series, just feel free to get in contact with us. Um, and today, we're very excited to have Dr. Felix Dorn with us. Um, can someone please mute themselves? Um, thanks. Um, so Dr. Felix Dorn works as a postdoc at the Department of Development Studies at the University of Vienna. He studied international economic studies at Innsbruck University at the National University of Cordoba. I'm probably pronouncing things wrong in Argentina. Um, and in 2021, he finished his PhD. Um, at Innsbruck University with a focus on political ecology and the global lithium production network. His current research focuses on the global politi political economy of decarbonization and the energy transition and the accompanying valor valorization of climate change commodities, such as lithium, copper and green hydrogen in Latin America. Um, and he's a visiting researcher at various different universities including Utrecht in Netherlands, the Center for Latin American Research at the University of Amsterdam, and his knowledge transfer oriented contributions include um, photo series, articles, and documentary film. So he's doing like a wide range of multimedia interventions as well, which is great. And I think he has a website as well that maybe we can post in the chat to look at kind of more of these multimedia interventions. Um, and he's also been published in various popular outlets as well. Um, so his topic today is on the geopolitical economy of the, of the energy transition, looking specifically at lithium. Um, and he's going to speak for about 30 minutes, and then we can have um, space for discussion and Q&A. So I'm going to hand over now to Felix. Thanks. All right, yeah. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Uh, very nice to be part of your series and also a great initiative. Um, I hope you're having some lunch while listening or something like that. And um, I would like to talk a bit about um, the geopolitical economy of the energy transition using the example of lithium mining in, in Argentina. Um, at the moment, um, as I said, I'm, I'm studying the case of hydrogen, green hydrogen, and I'm already leaving to do field work in South America on Monday, but I certainly have more empirical work done on lithium. I studied, studied the case of lithium in Argentina um, and Chile between uh, 2017 and 2020, but of course, basically as an ongoing strand of work. And I would like to start with a brief introduction uh, to the green technological energy transition and its uh, materiality, and then illustrate a bit the case of lithium and new conflicts related to that, and conclude um, with uh, some thoughts on how to conceptualize all this maybe. Um, so let's dive right in uh, for the contemporary uh, multiple crises, but especially for the climate crisis. Um, actors of both the institutional and the private sector usually foster techno-optimistic solution strategies such as the green economy and within the framework of the European Green Deal, for example, um, the European Union aims to decarbonize uh, the European economy by 2050. Um, so that means to make it cl climate neutral. And of course, the same is also being pursued at, by, by, the, by other uh, states and at, and at the different uh, national levels. And the focus here is on, on new technologies and some sort of fuel switch. So it is about the replacement of fossil fuels with renewable energies. And the electrification of transport in, in particular. So changing the drive system instead of fostering structural uh, transformation. And all in all, uh, the energy transition is seen as an ecological modernization package with technological innovations as, as 
the key to decoupling growth from carbon dioxide emissions and fossil consumption. And closely linked to this are new geopolitical interests and constellations. Um, so for example, onshoring, which means the relocation of raw material extraction of, of crit uh, critical resources to uh, the European Union. So I think a very interesting aspect of, of the global energy transition is technological fix or technological fix in a Harvey sense, um, whereby the central narrative is green growth. So it's about new sales markets for the out, uh, automotive industry. It's about new green jobs and it's about an increasing decarbonization of society. And for the United States, uh, lithium is listed as a critical resource since 2018 for the European Union since 2020. And of course, um, this is mainly due to the increasing demand for certain uh, raw materials in the context of the green technological en energy transition. Um, we see that here in a recent note uh, published on the World Economic Forum's website, the great mineral scramble, how can we provide the materials needed for the energy transition? We see thousands of, of similar notes every day. And what I want to point out here is that the criticality of, of a raw material, in this case lithium, is of course socially constructed and depends on the design of the energy transition project. So that means the chosen transition path. And to exemplify that in the context um, of the emergent energy transition and its policies, the massive spread of solar energy, wind energy, e-mobility and energy storage um, causes an increasing demand for certain strategic raw materials. As we, as we see here, for example, an electric vehicle requires significantly more raw materials than a car with a conventional diesel or a gasoline engine. And among those raw materials is also lithium. Um, it is considered a minor metal. Um, and today it is mainly used in lithium ion batteries for energy storage. So st stationary storage or electric vehicles. Electric vehicles are certainly the most important driver of the demand for lithium. And um, so while resources relevant for the energy transition include cobalt, copper, nickel, and many others, um, lithium is certainly the one that has received considerable uh, media attention. Um, in this figure, we, um, it's an, um, yeah, basically the expect of the International Energy Agency. They expect the demand for lithium to increase um, 43 times by 2040 compared to 2020. So quite uh, a huge or massive increase. But that doesn't mean that a renewable energy system in general requires more resources, but it certainly requires different resources. So we have a new, or it provokes a new uh, focus or refocus on metals, uh, particularly. The relevance of lithium for the energy transition and the geopolitical situation is also reflected in a strong price increase, particularly since early uh, 2022. Lithium prices increased from 7,000 US dollars per ton of lithium carbonate to more than 50,000 US dollars in just a few months. And spot market prices even reached up to 80,000 uh, US dollars uh, last year. And not only demand, I'm rushing through a bit, but that, that is more context. Um, and not only demand and prices are rising, but also production is, is expected to increase in the coming years. So analysts expect a continually strong production increase for Australia in particular, but at some distance also followed by Argentina. And it is important to make a distinction here between different deposits. So uh, on one hand, we have conventional extraction. That means uh, mining from rock deposits. Uh, those projects are faster in operation to, to yeah, um, put them in place, but more expensive. And um, conventional deposits are also the ones uh, discussed in the European Union, for example, in Portugal uh, and Spain. And in contrast, lithium can be extracted uh, very cheaply from unconventional brine, brine deposits in uh, Latin, Amer uh, Latin America, especially in the Latin American Andes. And it is precisely these deposits in the high Andes that have been the focus of particular attention in the lithium discussion for several years now, located in, in the so-called lithium triangle of Northern Argentina, um, well, northwest Argentina, um, with a series of salt flats, northern Chile with the uh, the Salar de Atacama, and southwestern Bolivia with the uh, Salar de Ujuni, as we can see here on, on the map. 
This region combines 56% bit more of the world's resources and 51% of the, of the reserves. Um, <clears throat> and in my work, I have focused mainly on this uh, production or upstream side, um, but the fact that a raw material can be found in a certain place does not really mean much at first. Um, for the local population of Northwest Argentina, for example, lithium has no meaning per se. So uh, um, Rio Francos expressed that very well in an article from last year with the saying that geology is not destiny and uh, yet the term lithium triangle um, reveals the strong orientation of, of a singular region towards a single raw material. Um, so expressions like the Saudi Arabia of lithium, white gold, lithium triangle, yeah, all that uh, would have to be considered as social attributions and constructions and uh, correspond to what Gavin Bridge would probably call a commodity supply zone. Um, I will come back to this in a moment using Argentina as an example. Uh, but first, before I go, into detail, um, I would like to very briefly explain my, my theoretical conceptual framework and my methodological approach. Um, for this research project, uh, I mainly combine global production networks, um, so the GPN approach with political ecology. And the main goal was to apply the GPN approach to the extractive sector. Um, GPN and political ecology do indeed have some theoretical uh, overlaps, such as multiscularity, the focus on actors and uh, questions of power as well. Um, but political ecology allows for focusing on the socio-ecological impacts of local environmental change and the resulting conflicts or environmental conflicts. And I think it, it complements GPN very well with a specific um, understanding of nature. So, the perception of nature structured by discourses of knowledge and power, also by an explicit um, conflict orientation in uh, Latin America, certainly the inclusion of historical dimensions, especially coloniality, and um, fourth, also a normative perspective. And um, this combination of GPN and political ecology unfolds along the entire um, GPN, as we can see here in this uh, figure. I've modified a graph from Co et al. Uh, 2008, and I also added a micro level to better analyze divergent territorial logics and, and winners and losers of local environmental change. And it's, it is important to note that it's not about working through the levels from global to local, but about actor networks that have to be seen in a relational perspective across different scales. Uh, I will come to come back to this figure uh, at the end. Um, so I hope it gets clear by then. Um, and in general, next to the question of value creation, I was particularly interested in the impact of lithium mining on the indigenous communities of the region. Um, for my thesis, I selected two case studies in Argentina. Um, so after a four months exploratory journey uh, through the region, I spent a total of seven months in, in two uh, communities. Both case studies are located in the Argentine Puna, which is a high plateau um, between about 3,500 and 4,500 meters above sea level. And the region is located in the, the province of Cujuy, quite far away from Buenos Aires um, and very close to the Chilean border. There's been a paved road here since about 2005, but until the 1970s, there was actually no direct road at all to the provincial capital, uh, San Salvador de Jujuy, as you can see in, uh, on the map. And in the national context, um, the Puna is often referred to as an empty or unused space. So as you can all imagine, uh, this space is inhabited by um, people, by numerous indigenous communities, and they suddenly find themselves uh, at the center of global economic processes and face lithium mining in very different ways. Um, so on the one hand, there's adaptation and cooperation with mining companies, for example, in Huancar in the communities um, at the Salar de Oleros Cauchari. Um, 
there's 10 communities in total in, in, in this area. And on the other hand, there's resistance and protest uh, in neighboring communities, basically. For example, in Santuario de Tres Pozos and the other communities of the Salina Grandes. Uh, there's uh, 33 communities in total in that area. And in such a context, obviously the, the subjectivity of a researcher plays an, an important role. Um, I try to deal with this um, yeah, basically with, with the time factor, so 11, 12 months on site, especially in the indigenous communities, and on the other hand, uh, using an essentially ethnographic empirical me me methodical or methodological implementation. I won't go too much into detail, but if you have questions about that, we can um, uh, do that afterwards. And with that, uh, I would like to talk about the embedding of, of Argentina into uh, the global lithium production network to give you a bit more, more context. Um, in this photo, uh, we see the lithium mining project of Sales de Jujuy in the Salar de Olados Cauchari at 4,100 meters above sea level. So um, as I just said, uh, this is the area of the cooperating communities, including Wankar. And in the background, um, you can already see uh, another pool, which is the construction of uh, another mine, Minera Exar. Um, and we can also see, if you um, yeah, uh, really focus on, on the, uh, the extension of the, the, the mine, um, we can see that, that there's an extension of the Salesi Jujuy project, which is already visible and has been um, um, accepted just uh, some months ago. And in this unconventional extraction method, a brine under, from, from the underground is, is pumped into evaporation pools and, and evaporates, uh, and that leaves a liquid with a very high uh, lithium concentration, uh, with this, which is then processed into lithium carbonate. And uh, this, obviously, the fear that a hydrogeological stress will cause fresh water to flow in leading to a drop in the groundwater table and the salinization of fresh water. So water is one of the, the most important questions in, in one of the, uh, the driest regions of the world, obviously. Um, lithium mining in Argentina is essentially a development of the past few years. And yet Argentine lithium carbonate exports already play quite an important role uh, on the world market. Um, Australia, Chile, Argentina, and, and Argentina, uh, China and Argentina, sorry, currently produce 97.5% of the world's lithium. And um, Argentine lithium carbonate is, for example, the most important source of imports for the United States. But the majority of Argentina's exports, um, and that is 51% go to uh, China, 15% to Japan, and, and uh, another 10% to South Korea. And of course, there's a spatial materialization of this described boom. Um, the first commercial project in the country was inaugurated in the 1990s. Um, and that is a decade marked by President uh, Carlos Menem and the Washington Consensus. And during that period, there was a very pronounced flexibilization, privatization on neoliberalization of the mining sector. Um, there was also a new mining legislation implemented and that is still in force today. And in 1997, the American Lithco, which is today Livent, uh, opened the Phoenix project in the north of Catamarca province. You can see that here as a red dot. Oh, sorry, it's in uh, German, but never mind. Uh, the red, red one is commercial active um, exploitation. And besides uh, the Phoenix project, lithium mining in Argentina can rather be seen as a more recent development. Uh, we see numerous projects here, almost 60 in total in various stages of development, construction, pilot production, etc. And the second commercial project was opened in 2014 by uh, Sales de Jujuy at the Salar de Oleros Cauchari in Jujuy province, also marked in red. And um, that is the mine um, you've just seen on, on the photo. Uh, before. And it is important to mention that not all the projects um, actually or will actually start producing. A lot of that is also mining speculation. Uh, since lithium is not traded on the stock exchange, at least not really, um, but the mining companies are, 
well, uh, you can imagine. And in addition, and because of that, many companies try to secure direct access to the raw material. But we can also see several points um, here or dots on, on, this, on, on some soft flats. Um, so um, I'm going to show you a bit of a zoom in on the Salar de Oloros Cochari. Um, for example, at the Salar de Oloros Cochari in, in the Argentine province of Jujuy, uh, we see that there's not just one company working there. Um, remember, it's the one uh, from the picture. And um, we also see how different companies try to secure direct access to the resource, uh, making use of partnerships or joint ventures. Um, in the case of lithium specifically, uh, mining companies usually work with companies from the automotive, um, battery or, or chemical industry. And the operating company Salisti Hukui, for example, is a joint venture between the Australian mining company Orokode and the Japanese car manufacturer um, Toyota. And um, the operating company Mineda XR, whose uh, project is still under construction, is in turn a joint venture of the Canadian company Lithium Americas and the Chinese company Ganfeng Lithium. And I think this already shows quite well that the, that the development processing and also export of the Argentine deposits are controlled by transnational companies and the further processing of the raw material then takes place in countries like China, Japan, South Korea, etc. And the, the cathodes, battery cells and battery modules needed for electric cars are also primarily produced here. Uh, I will come back to this also um, briefly at the end. And in Argentina itself, um, the, the development narratives described before are reproduced at the national level. Um, both Argentine politicians and the media refer to lithium as white gold. Um, the newspaper Perfil even has um, the headline, lithium, the white gold that can lead Argentina out of its misery, or um, Infobuy, another news um, platform says, industrialization of lithium as a way to realize an, an Argentine dream. So um, that is sort of the, the idea about lithium. And uh, the Argentine president, Alberto Fernandez, said in the middle of last year during a, a trip to the United States that lithium has to do with the energy of the future. The key, however, is that lithium is not exported, but that Argentina becomes a supplier of batteries. Um, and mining in Argentina has been organized federally since the reforms of the 1990s. And I therefore looked in particular at the province of Jujuy, uh, where we can find very similar, if not more pronounced narratives of green development and progress. And on, on the one hand, numerous battery factories have been announced in the past, and lithium mining is verbally linked again and again to uh, yeah, clean energy, new technologies, or simply the the fiber optic connection of indigenous communities and thus also legitimized um, by that. And this green extractivism, um, so that means a framing of resource extraction as a necessity for climate protection, also becomes clear in a quote, a quote by, by Governor um, Morales uh, from November 2022, where he says, el litio no mata la pacha, no mata el planeta, es para salvar el planeta. So literally, um, Lithium doesn't kill the planet, uh, doesn't kill Pachamama. Lithium doesn't kill the planet. On the contrary, uh, it saves the planet. And on the other hand, it quickly becomes clear that it is mainly about creating a good investment climate and receiving foreign uh, currencies. So the, the province's new slogan, uh, for example, Jujuy Energia Viva, so Jujuy Living Energy, is explicitly aimed at attracting um, investors. And um, so we see a reproduction of this future raw material discourse at the national and regional level. And subsequently, the lithium deposits of, of the province are valorized by means of concessions uh, to private companies. Um, and this commodifies previously communally used land. And as a result, different territorial uh, logics overlap within the value chain. So the place-based indigenous communities are not really considered in the government's discourse. And this, this is very problematic in so far as in theory, uh, the state has the obligation of ensuring 
minority rights. Um, and this also includes the rights of indigenous people, obviously. Um, the rights of indigenous communities are protected in, in the Argentine constitution by article uh, 75, but more importantly by the International Labour Organization's Convention uh, 169, uh, ratified in, in 2000. And this gives um, the communities the right to self-determination, self-government, ownership of natural resources, sovereignty of, over the territories they inhabit, and the right to prior consultation, um, so consulta previa, should they be affected in any way, directly or indirectly. And I would, would like to compare um, the different local reactions to uh, lithium mining with the help with the help of two quotes. Um, these are, of course, somewhat representative of the respective community. Uh, for example, um, the treasurer of the indigenous community of Wankar, so a, co a cooperating community close to the Salisu Hukui project, um, says, I'm neither for nor against. They, so referring to the mining companies, give us work, they support us uh, and invest in our community. But I'm also afraid, afraid that we won't have any water left, that our environment and our place for our children will be destroyed. I think this quote expresses quite a very ambivalent relationship with uh, lithium mining. And this becomes even more clear when we contrast it with a quote from the president of the community of Tres Pozos, so one of the protesting communities of the Salinas Grandes. She says what he, so Morales, the governor, calls the future is not the future. It means bread for today and hunger for tomorrow. All the money is only for a moment, but then everything will be destroyed and we will have nothing left. What kind of future is it that he will leave to our grandchildren, to our children? That is no future at all. We don't need lithium, we are fine. So very different from uh, Wankar, very negative attitude and uh, position. And since the beginning of the first exploration projects around 2010 in Salina Grandes, a resistant movement started to emerge and uh, the 33 communities created an assembly, um, the Mesa de Salina Grandes, Laguna de Huachatayoc, through which um, all decisions are made and they draw attention to their situation using the slogan, el agua vale más que litio, so water is worth more than lithium, as you can see here at an assembly um, in this quite beautiful church. Um, and at this meeting, it was also decided to realize a protest action a week later in the provincial capital, San Salvador de Jujuy, um, and in addition, some communities also took action and made it um, legal action and, and made it to the National Supreme Court. And in their protest, the communities of the Salina Grandes tried to visibilize and nationalize the conflict with the buzzword water. But the raw material itself does not really play an important role in, in the conflict. Actually, unlike in many other cases, it is not a matter of protest against the companies, but mainly against the state. So the resource is more of a, a hook. I, I think that that's the word, um, because there's a historical protest in the region against, um, against the state, which is about self-determination, about autonomy in terms of territory. So it's about the titles for the land that the communities historically occupy. And in this context, I argue that the two communities pursue different, already historically established strategies in dealing with the state or with the capitalist economy. And in Wankar, we see a strategy of negotiation with the mining companies. The aim is to maximize benefits in terms of generating jobs or with the aim of saving the village. So the frequently heard sentence is, uh, for example, we need the lithium extraction so um, our village doesn't die. Without the mines, young people would go to the, to the city. And in Tres Pozos, on the other hand, we see a strategy of resistance and protest against the state using visible symbolic protest actions as well as legal steps. And the goal of this protest is self-determination and autonomy regarding uh, the territory. So we can see a community that relies more on collective action in order to achieve its goals. Um, yeah, let me try to draw a little conclusion. What does all this tell us um, and why is all that important? Um, in this 
figure I have adapted my theoretical conceptual framework and I filled it in in relation to lithium mining. I'm sorry for having that only in German, but it's not that complicated. Um, it becomes very clear that lithium mining is embedded in structures of the capitalist economy. In this case, it is green economy and the construction of a future raw material. So that is like the, the macro top level but it is only in interaction with the national and regional discourse of development and modernization um, that this leads to, to the large scale resource development in the Argentine Puna we can uh, observe. And at the national, uh, at the local level, indigenous communities face lithium mining with great uncertainty. In some communities, this leads to manifest conflicts with the government and in others to a very ambivalent relationship. So more, uh, Latin conflict. And in general, it can be said that profits are yeah, quite unequally distributed in favor of international companies, um, but environmental risks are un unequally distributed at the expense of indigenous communities. I think we, we, we can state that. And in, in, in the context of lithium mining, we can also see that structural power symmetries are, are reproduced, um, existing dependencies are deepened and, and uh, social autonomy is, is undermined. And this circumstance is, is often described with the term green colonialism or green sacrifice zones or green extractivism, which I already mentioned. And on the one hand, this is very true. Um, but on the other hand, and this is what I aim at now, is at the same time, those yeah, dichotomizing terms uh, such as green colonialism are analytically not very helpful for the case of lithium, um, because in fact, there are new geopolitical shifts and dynamics in battery production upstream, midstream, downstream. And we, we can see a very or highly complex global production network with the very, very uh, heterogeneous actors, as you can see here on, on, on this, uh, in this figure. And while upstream was until recently dominated by the so-called big four companies, so the American uh, company Albamail, SQM from Chile, Tianqi from China and, and Livent from the United States. Today, the market is mainly dominated by the entry of, of new Chinese players. Um, a prominent example is certainly Ganfeng Lithium, uh, which is also an important stakeholder of Mineda XA. So you remember the, the project uh, under construction you've seen on the, on the picture. And we see this at all levels of the value chain. This is my last slide, I'm already finishing. Um, midstream, for example, we see a 76% share of, of China alone in cell and battery production. And at the same time, um, capacity actually says nothing about the, the dominant uh, company. So uh, LG from South Korea currently has the largest share in, in Europe and the Chinese company CATL has just announced a very huge investment for Europe's uh, largest battery factory in, in Hungary. And um, yeah, besides, or in addition to that, what I haven't addressed here um, are certainly the European efforts and also the, the American efforts to reduce import dependency of critical raw materials and to promote onshoring within the, within the United uh, States or the European Union. So for example, the extraction of lithium in countries like Portugal and, and Spain, or also French shoring in countries like Serbia. And, uh, what I would state to conclude sort of is that in relation to the energy transition, the analytical value of, of concepts uh, such as North and South is increasingly limited um, because uh, we're facing a series of, of geopolitical uh, shifts and a political economic shift. So um, that is sort of new and that goes a bit hand in hand. Yeah, thank you. Maybe we can go into detail a bit more um afterwards thanks so much felix it was really really fascinating um also to get such a detailed analysis of these different levels of contestation at local and global levels and i think also to kind of unpack green extractivism the way you did was really useful so that you we like troubling the dichotomies and looking more at the nuances of this contestation and this development. So I think you were really helpful in giving us that kind of perspective. Um, and now to look at these geopolitical shifts that are ongoing with uh, the green transition. 
Um, so I'm going to open up the floor. If you want to put questions or comments in the chat, please feel free to, or if you want to um, speak, just put up your hand. Um, Uh, thanks for posting my uh, website. Sure. Um, so maybe I can just ask her a question to get the ball rolling. Um, just sure. around the research methodology, which you said you were happy to speak about more in the conversation. Um, so just around your positionality and how how you embedded yourself in the community, what issues around like trust was there? Um, I also know activists often get targeted in mining communities. So were there issues around how to protect activists and anonymity and confidentiality and that kind of thing? So just any, maybe some of the ethical issues that came up during the research would be useful. Yeah, sure. Uh, great question. Um, first, it was a bit difficult to um, earn the trust necessary to, uh, to do research and to do interviews and, and so on. Um, and um, what certainly helped and, and th that was a great advantage for me was to come back uh, so I did four months of, of, of research or exploratory uh, trip and um, I said I would come back in I think it was like almost a year and I came back and, and that certainly helped quite a lot and opened uh, many doors um, but besides that on a more, yeah, let's say, ethical uh, level. Obviously, if I do interviews with people working in the mines, or for example, the presidents of, of um, the indigenous communities, most of them work in the mines, and um, they fear that um, very. They they usually try not to say anything negative about the companies or about the state or about their situation. Um, so it's very important um, to anonymize, um, obviously, um, what I do. And this was maybe easier regarding my research and a bit more difficult regarding my photo essays because I had the, the opinion or the idea that I would wanted to distribute a bit beyond academia. I think that that's important. And I try to engage as much as possible in, in, in doing yeah, some sort of transfer-oriented um, publications. And photo essays and, and, and documentaries, for example, although I think it's, it's, it's great work and it's, and it's very important, it's also, one ha has also to be really um, careful. And um, I try to choose, yeah, subjectively uh, after one year of being in, in there in the area, I. Uh, I talked to the people and, and, and I, I, I chose people um, <clears throat> as, in, <clears throat> as interviewees knowing that they would not have to fear any bad consequence uh, out of that. And um, that's maybe, yeah, it, it's quite subjective, um, but um, that's how I try to address these issues. And <clears throat> regarding the research uh, question itself, um, well, what is probably most common is, is like a methodological pluralism. So it's not just about, I don't know, designing uh, um, a questionnaire and, and going to the area. It's more about adapting and choosing from different methods and, and combining stuff, which is not really like textbook-like, but it's, I think it's how it works in, in practice. And I. It, yeah, I made some good um, experiences, but also having uh, quite some time in the area to do so. Thanks, Felix. Um, yeah, so it would be maybe if there's time interesting to just hear a bit about how the photo essays were able to make interventions beyond academia. But um, there's a question in the chat, I think from Julia, who said, thanks for the great presentation. I was wondering if you encountered um, any gendered issues with the supply chain and within mining communities? So maybe to respond to that first. 
thank you, Julia, for for the question. Um, that that's a pressing issue, actually. Yeah, I mean, there's not <clears throat> unlike uh, gold mining and copper mining in the um, Calama, for example, crossing the border to Chile or in uh, Peru or in, in Brazil. There's not much prostitution uh, or or something like that in in in, in the Andes. I mean. Uh, well, not in, in this part of the Andes regarding lithium mining. And it's the area is, or those communities are very small. So the largest community is Suskis, um, 2000 people live there. So it's a village basically. And um, there's, yeah, there's, there's great distance between indigenous people and miners coming from the, the, the urban centers, uh, for example who stay there for two weeks or three weeks and then go back home. Um, so I did not encounter that, but on the other hand, um, there's some very relevant gendered issues. And that is one, um, uh, or, or first um, that the, yeah, the, the distribution of labor. Um, so in the mines, we usually see um, male labor and male employees. And they, they are gone for like two or three weeks, as I said, um, also from the indigenous communities who live close by. They live and sleep close to the mines in, in, the, in the mining camps. So women are in charge of taking care of the kids, of, of animals, of um, all this kind of uh, tasks or, or yeah, um, home related uh, work. Um, so this causes some sort of reproduction of um, gendered labor or division of, of, of labor. And uh, secondly, uh, what is interesting, I, there's no research about that, but I think that would be interesting um, in the case of, of Salina Grande. So the, the communities um, protesting against lithium mining, um, there's, yeah, usually the ones uh, in the, the prominent examples of resistance are men, but um, what is happening um, in place is, is mostly driven by, by women. Um, there's uh, quite some women in the background um, that organize uh, the entire protest, that, that organize um, the, the board meetings, that um, organize uh, all communication, etc. So I think that is an interesting question. How does um, this protest and resistance relate to gender roles, maybe, and and um, yeah, the role of women in, in particular. Thanks, thanks, Felix. Um, are there any other questions or comments? Um, sure, please go ahead. You can unmute yourself, um, Relitza, and put on your camera if you wish. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm not going to use my camera because the connection. My connection is quite bad. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Thank you for, for your presentation. Quite interesting. My, my questions are, actually, I have several questions. And they are, I understand that they are a bit far-fetched and not directly related to, 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 to the particularities of your research. <laughs> um, but I. I, I was just wondering whether you got a glimpse of any of these while spending time in, in these communities. Um, in terms of organizing the protest, um, uh, whether whether there was any that you're aware of any foreign inter interference, because for example, with um, in Serbia, the big protests against the lithium mining, um, it is kind of well known that there was very strong Russian interference and a lot of these protests were stoked by, you know, uh, Russian, um, um, obviously oil and gas interests um, um, that, that, that clash with uh, lithium mining. Um, whether there's any evidence of anything like this going on in these communities. Uh, I mean, I'm not necessarily saying Russian, but any oil and gas interests trying to, to stir up these protests there. And um, my other question is whether you observed 
any consciousness, any realization of these communities in, of the geopolitical significance of what they're doing. And I'm situating my question, <laughs> the recent announcement of, um, uh, and I don't know if you're aware of this, but that, that um, Argentina are, and Brazil are considering a common currency, adopting a common currency. Um, and um, obviously that, 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 that is kind of a big development for, for South America. Uh, so yeah, these are, these are my questions. And, and again, I understand that they are not directly linked to your research question, but if you have any observations uh, from your time there, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, regarding foreign interference, um, obviously, I mean, no case today is isolate or we, we like, that's what I mentioned. We can't consider uh, one case isolated from another case or uh, independent of other levels. Um, it is always embedded in, in a global capitalist economy. And um, first of all, in the area, for sure, we have foreign companies or transnational companies. Um, on the protest level, uh, we certainly have um, internet, the presence of international NGOs. So Amnesty International, um, United Nations is um, yeah, not very active there, but the Uni uh, United Nations Special uh, Rapporteur of, of Indigenous Rights, um, Jane uh, Hamis Anaya, has been has visited the area in like 2014, I think, and there's um, obviously also national NGOs or regional NGOs. Um, but the interesting aspect you mentioned here regarding the clash between lithium and fossil industry, I actually don't. I disagree a bit with that. Um, it might well. I, maybe there there were some Russian. Um, interests uh, present in, in Serbia, sure that that's possible, but the, the, the entire question of energy transition so far is basically actually an energy addition. Um, the, the, the ramp up of, 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 of renewable energy so far is, um, is marginal and adds up to um, fossil interests or fossil fuels. And um, what we can see is a strong presence of, and, and that is what I'm investigating right now, it's a strong presence of fossil fuel interests and fossil lobby pushing uh, green hydrogen, for example, because this also gives some sort of second life to um, gas and oil and, and so on, because there's not only green hydrogen, because, but, but also blue hydrogen, for example, and using carbon capture and storage, and this could also be promoted as clean. Like in the end, it's it's all labeled as clean hydrogen. Um, so there's strong interests of the fossil fuel industry in pushing um, hydrogen, but I've never experienced anything like um, pushing resistance against lithium. Um, and I could not imagine why actually. Um, yeah, that's regarding the first question. And the second question uh, regarding, I, I, I don't think it was really a question regarding the common currency, but um, more of an observation. Um, I think this is still very unlikely. I mean, there there have been some interests in in or that fostered this idea before, like ten years ago, uh, when there was also this wave of or this pink tide, this wave of progressive governments, um, with uh, the Cristina Kirchner government in Argentina and um, also Lula in in, in Brazil. Now we again have some sort of progressive governments in, in Chile even more than before. Um, this, yeah, this idea of a common uh, currency um, and important, most importantly re related to lithium, there's also this idea of fostering some sort of lithium OPEC or um, OPEP, I, I think somehow something like that it was called. Um, I struggle in, uh, yeah, in, in saying how likely that is. Um, it's an interesting idea, um, but um, lithium is also not economically actually not that important. Um, we, we can't compare lithium to copper or 
even to soybeans or something like that. So it, it's it's irrelevant basically for the Argentine economy um, compared to other resources or primary goods. Um, and lithium is also not really, yeah, let's say it's not a rare earth or something like that. It's, 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 it's geographically very distributed. Um, it de just depends on the price if you can really val valorize um, the different deposits. Yeah, well, and my I did not really answer your question, your second question, but I, I hope that uh, that helped a bit. No, that, that's, that's perfectly fine. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, and then there's another question in the chat from AB, um, who says, thank you for your wonderful pictures and presentations. My question is, from your research interest in lithium in Argentina, I came to know that a lot of lithium sites on Ramsar, Ramsar protected areas. Is this the case in your study sites? If so, can you please talk about how are Ramsar obligations navigated by the lithium mining companies? No, in my case, it isn't. In Chile, it is, right? Um, this, <laughs> there was... Um, there was some sort of protected area, provincial um, protected, how was it called? Ecological provincial park, something like that, in, um, close to the Salis de Jujuy project, uh, actually um, within this park. Um, and I first, first when, I, when I got to the area, I found that very interesting and I followed that a bit um, and, and asked everybody about um, if they if if they knew what would happen to the park um, or to this protected area, and nobody actually knew much, and um, so after a while I dropped it. Um, what is maybe interesting is that uh, talking to officials, it seems like everybody uh, everybody forgot about um, having that protected site. Uh, it's not Ramsar, but um, yeah, it's it's a different protected side and uh it does actually does not play any role today um, yeah thanks um avi i don't know if you have any follow-up or oh, that just covers you okay okay you covered so thank you in the chat um are there any final maybe we have time for one last question or comment before we conclude but i see people are starting to have to leave Um, Felix, I don't know if you would like to add any final comments or reflections. Um, no, not not really. I, I hope I was able to point out that um, those concepts dealing with this relation between uh, uh, North and South or Europe and, and, and Latin America are on one hand true or applicable and on the other hand a bit of analytically uh, limited. Um, that doesn't mean that, that this is also um, politically limited. I, I think green colonialism, for example, is um, politically could be a, a strong term uh, and could be used by NGOs or is used by NGOs. And I think that that is fine. Um, I just think that uh, we have to yeah, care more about um, um, this multi-scalar multi and, and relational perspective and, and focus on the agency of different actors um, because um, just the fact that there is a resource um, does not mean that it's actually exploited in the future. And I think we can see that very well in Salina Grandes. Um, and um, yeah, that, that's what I wanted to show basically. Yeah. Um, thanks so much, Felix. I mean, I think you're also pointing out how important it is to really go into the details of each case. So I was thinking like in the context that I come from in South Africa, green colonialism is used as um, against environmental activists who are campaigning against coal. So mm -hmm. they are targeted for being uh, green colonialists. Um, wow. So and kind of um, it's a government discourse um, because the government's very invested in coal. So in each kind of context, these terms are used 
in different ways for different agendas. So to kind of unpack these power contestations is really interesting. Um, so just to say thank you so much for your presentation um, and for everyone who joined us today. It, it was really, really fascinating and hopefully we can continue the discussion um, and yeah, we'll circulate the recording once it's up. And so just thanks so much for your time and good luck with your next field trip to Argentina looking at green thank hydrogen. Thank you so much. Yeah. Really fascinating. Good luck with your series. Um, I'm looking forward to hear a bit more about that soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.